right. Well, next up, we've got Keith Kelson. Keith is joining us from the West Coast. He's going to be speaking with us about seismic hazards. So, Keith, the floor is yours. Uh, go, go figure that I'd be talking about seismic hazards. So here you go. Um, here's our overall learning objectives. Um, we want to just basically discuss seismic hazards, the types, and then how the inputs are used in a risk informed framework. So, um, a little bit of background, just uh, 30 seconds real quick on, on my background. My, my graduate degree was in fluvial geomorphology. And then when I got a real job in consulting industry, the concept was, well, you can use what you learn in fluvial geomorph to apply to seismic hazard. And we, we started to work on paleo seismic information. So for the last 25, 28 years prior to joining the Corps, uh, my task was to apply fluvial geomorphic principles to seismic hazards. And I became engulfed in the seismic hazards. So that's why I'm talking about paleo seismic. And as, as some of you might know that I've moved on to other things, applying it to basically other um, hazards, as you'll know later. So I'm going to try to um, have my screen click forward right now, and I'm not sure why it's not doing that. Describe the basic components of seismic hazard analysis, and then explain the two classes of seismic hazard analyses. There's deterministic and probabilistic and how they differ. And if you could get one thing out of this lecture, it would be understanding the difference between deterministic and probabilistic hazards, how they differ, and then I guess one C would be how you can use that in the risk-informed um, dam and levy safety framework. Remember, this is about the hazard loading. It's the very first node in the, um, in the logic tree. Um, again, as you all know, hazard is a uh, risk is actually the component of the hazard times the performance, how to stuff do given that certain loading. And then you add in the consequences as you all know. So just a real simplified geologist perspective on risk and form or risk. And we are focused only on hazard today, okay, in this lecture. And um, note to self, note to the presenters or the um, administrators here, we got to fix this slide. But basically, these are going through the, the five primary seismic hazards. And the, the intent is to have this slide give them one at a time. So I'm just going to do all five strong ground shaking. The ground, the earth moves, liquefaction. If you have saturated, um, unconsolidated materials, they will liquefy, and that causes permanent displacement and loss of strength. Um, we saw that in Fukushima. Uh, landsliding, same thing, it's just on a slope, you know, with just loss of strength, and the hillside comes down. Sometimes those hillsides come down into our reservoirs and um, would cause a um, res uh, uh, wave in the Reservoir that's different than reservoir siege. The fourth hazard reservoir siege is the ground motions actually impose a, a setup, a wave in the in the water column, and that could potentially overtop um, features. And then the last and oddball one is permanent ground motion, and it, this gets a lot of play when it happens. But technically and probabilistically, it's low probability throughout the world. There's only a couple of dams that have ever experienced fault rupture. Um, and I got to be honest with you, the poster child shown here on Chi Chi uh, is not one of them. Just keep that in mind. People use it a lot. A lot of engineers call on Chi Chi as permanent ground deformation is not true. The fault didn't actually rupture the dam. Ask me about that later. But basically, the big player is strong ground shaking. Okay. So here's how that affects dams and levees. We got the um, the five different hazards, primary hazards on the left, and shown in red to coincide with strong ground shaking. For earthen dams, you can get the cracking of spillway walls, you get erosion, you get breach. That's the failure mode. For concrete dams, you can do these three things. You can crack the monolith, you can crack the spillway walls, you can deform the trunnion gates. And you guys, after this hazard presentation, are gonna address some of these primary things. These are the things that you should be concerned about right here. The, the breach related to these different failure modes. 
the other ones that you should be aware of, but may or may not ever encounter. Um, well, liquefaction in earthen dams does occur. We have to be prepared for that. So in your risk assessment, you should be considering liquefaction of the, of the foundation, of the embankment, and then uh, of the materials that, that are associated with those two things. Um, one of the questions just for yourself, think about this. Why is there never liquefaction for a concrete dam? Okay, I'm going to leave that unanswered. You should be able to figure that out. Landsliding. Yeah, if it hits the water, you're going to get a wave and that could induce overtopping. The siege, the same deal. A wave gets set up in the reservoir from the from the motions of the substratum. You can induce overtopping. It's very, very rare. And then fault rupture. You know, if you got a rupture through either the earthen embankment or the concrete, you're going to get internal erosion and some sort of connectivity between the reservoir waters and downstream. And if there's any potential head there, you're going to end up eroding out the material. This is what we just developed of um, mitigation on Isabella. So again, there are only two faults, uh, sorry, two dams throughout the world that have ever been mitigated for fault rupture. One is Matahina in Colombia. The other is the Isabella Dam in um, Southern California. So how do we do that? How do we evaluate this? This is a typical seismic analysis um, failure mode. I think that Scott Shoebridge probably developed this. I'm not sure where I got it, but basically the seismic loading comes in here. And the next one, this is how we do the, the loading. It's a seismic hazard curve. It's just like a hydrologic loading curve. It's just rotated on the axes, right? We have the AEP on the on the y-axis and the acceleration on the x-axis for seismic for hydrologic loading. It's the other way around. You got the AEP on the x-axis. Don't worry about that. But this is standard seismic protocol to promote produce the seismic hazard curve like this. It's a, it, this is a semi-log plot. We usually do it in semi-log with AEP in log and the acceleration in linear. You take that curve and you put it into the performance node, and that's right here. The rest of the lectures relating to seismic hazard for us today are um, related to this. So I'm just talking about the hazard loading and other folks. I guess Adam is going to talk about seismic performance. Um, flak models are one way to do it. There's LS Dyna. There's lots of ways to do it. You're going to get more. So let's just talk about the basic components. There are two basic components in seismic sources. There's faults and there's aerial sources. This one is one of the best fault examples, and I provide it because there are different sub. There are faults that that are subcategories of the overall fault seismic source. So how do we get earthquakes? You get them on faults, period. That's, it's, the fault is the plane along which differential movement occurs because of energy release. Why does a fault exist? It's because uh, the, there's friction on that fault plane and when that, uh, the resistance between the different blocks on either side of the fault equals the frictional resistan resistance of the fault then it ruptures and it usually occurs catastrophically, usually, but not always. There are a couple three faults in California that the frictional resistance is equal to the, um, the input uh, relative motion and the faults just creep and they don't produce earthquakes. But when we produce earthquakes, you have stick slip, right? The faults are sticking and then they slip. And one of the best examples of that, I don't know if this is gonna work, let's see. Yeah, it is, okay, so interface earthquakes this is what we care about in Oregon, Washington, and Northern California. This is the big one. This is the M9 that we're talking about in Seattle and Portland, where you have a tectonic plate being subducted underneath a continental plate. There's stick slip along that frictional interface. And when it lets loose, it lets loose big because the area over which that energy is released is large. And so you get a lot of, a lot of energy released that's what we call magnitude. Magnitude nine is, uh, magnitude is a log scale, base 10, and it reflects the amount of energy that's released during the earthquake. There are other types of faults, in particular in the subduction zone, 
we have these intra-slab earthquakes. And those intra-slabs are the earthquakes that, that occur within, in this case, the Juan de Fuca plate, as it goes underneath North America, it fragments and it moves and it shifts as that thing's going underneath the ground. And it's those shifts that, that deform the plate and produce these basically moderate earthquakes, fives to sevens, basically. There's another type of earthquake in uh, another type of seismic source in Cascadia subduction zones, actually all subduction zones in the world. And those are the crustal sources. And these are the ones that actually you want to pay attention to the dams, because as the Juan de Fuca plate goes underneath North America, it's fragmenting North America. It stretches it, it, it extends it, it compresses it, and it basically cracks the overlying plate. And so those earthquakes are closer to our dams. And shout out to Josh Corbett from RMC for producing this slide, by the way. Um, these are the three main sources in a subduction zone. In most earthquakes that we have elsewhere outside of subduction zones, we're looking only at crustal sources, right? So how do we characterize that? This is a, uh, a way that um, we characterize the earthquake magnitude for deterministic and earthquake recurrence for probabilistic. And you look at the size of that fault, and this is where the geologists matter, right? Geology matters in this. You map out those faults, you see how long they are, how long they've had activity in a certain time period. In other words, are they active or inactive? So you can come up with the seismic source characteristics of the fault sources based on geologic information. Bottom line for all you who don't really care about this is there are ways to evaluate the magnitude of an earthquake that's produced on any given active fault. Okay, And how do we characterize that? You use a logic tree. These are different than event trees. Important point, a logic tree is different. It's a way to do bookkeeping on what those different characteristics of the sources are. So we look at the source geometry, we look at how thick the crust is, how the orientation, basically we look at the source characteristics, and those are all these different options of doing that. And for each node in the logic tree, there's a value. So you can see that the logic trees, by the time you get all the way to the end, there's a million different scenarios and sometimes a million different earthquake magnitudes that are generated for any given source. And you capture those in this column right here, RLME, which is recurring large magnitude earthquake. And you basically, how big an earthquake could this fault generate? And you have a million cases and you do a probability density function on those, and you say these range from five to six and a half, say, or in this case, you get as high as 0.7.4, and you can generate uh, a likelihood of get, generating that magnitude, not through time, but just a raw likelihood. And that's what we use for deterministic analyses. You determine that an earthquake, should an earthquake occur on this particular fault, which in in this case, is the Mirrors Fault in Oklahoma. Now, what's the likelihood of that? And that's what we need for risk assessments. So we do the temporal component. How often does that occur? And that's where paleo seismology comes in. We look back in the past to evaluate the likelihood of different earthquakes. And that tells us by looking forward what the likelihood of a future earthquake is, basically a return period. And you generate that and it turns into a probabilistic likelihood of a given magnitude. Okay, so it gets a little more complex than that, but well, that's the basics. And these logic trees allow the PSHA, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, to capture all of the uncertainty in our knowledge about that fault. So you might think there are some faults we got, we are omniscient on it, like the San Andreas fault. We should know exactly how big an earthquake and when that's gonna occur. And, and you may think that it's actually not true, but there are other faults where we have pretty good uh, knowledge on it and the epistemic uncertainty is small, right? Um, so those are faults. In areas mostly in the central and eastern US where most of our dam portfolio lies, we don't have specific faults. There's only two or three that we actually identify. That would be New Madrid, 
or the Southern Oklahoma allocogen along the Mears Fault, and then more recently, the um, Eastern Tennessee seismic zone, we think there's a fault buried in that image geophysically. But all of the other seismicity shown here in the USGS uh, map, actually, this is not the USGS, but in these seismic source zone maps are based on historical micro seismicity. So what's the flaw in that? Well, we've only been recording earthquakes for, I don't know, 100 years or so. But earthquakes occur on return periods of thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. So the historical period is limited and we have to look back. That's the justification. How do we look back? How do we, in other words, get at how big an earthquake it is? You, you construct a diagram that looks like this. It's called a Gutenberg-Richter curve. They did it in the 40s, so this is nothing new. Semi-log, you got a log here. It's a, it's a linear magnitude scale, but magnitude, magnitude is a log scale, so this is actually a log-log plot. And at some point, given the micro-seismicity, you can plot a root Gutenberg-Richter curve and estimate where the maximum magnitude is going to be. There's a certain die-off in there right here. Right here. So that's how we evaluate areas. We look at micro seismicity because we don't know where the fault is. We can't characterize the fault. So we have to use this proxy, which is historical seismicity. All right. That's probably TMI. So how does this how does this happen? That's the source characterization. So now what we really care about is what's the ground motions at our site? So given that a certain fault can produce a magnitude of a, you know, a certain magnitude and we're going to produce ground motions, but what's it going to be at the site? And there are three basic components in that. There's the source effects, which we just talked about, right? That's how big an earthquake it can generate and where is it going to be, right? So the magnitude, the type of slip and the return period for probabilistic, okay? So you generate this earthquake, but the path effects are also important. Like what does that energy have to go through from the hypocenter to our particular site. And that can vary greatly. It's based on geology, deep geophysical information are needed to characterize the path geology and the directivity or propagation direction. And then also the source to site distance. And this is just like um, source to site distance is what we call attenuation. The farther you are from that source, the lower the ground motions. It's just like if the guy if you turn on your radio in your car and you're in the car, it's loud. But then you get out of the car and you walk a block away, the radio is not very loud. It's the same concept, right? It's just the farther you are, the lower the, atten the ground motions are. And we, we characterize that, we quantify it statistically, and we'll get to that. The third component is site effects. How does your site respond to that ground motions that are, that are coming into it? And that is a huge area of research right now at the USGS where it's um, whether you're in a, a basin or on the top of a ridge can strongly affect your ground motions given the ground motions that are imposed from the path effects that are then imposed from the source effects. So you can see that's why we have to go all the way back to the earthquake source characteristics and then you have to characterize the geology along that path and then you have to characterize the site effects. So how do we do that? How have the engineers done it? Well, it's pretty simple. We just group it into six different classes and base those classes on the seismic geophysical velocity here. And there are attenuation relationships that characterize how your site is going to respond given a certain um, earthquake magnitude. So that's why we have these site classes A, B, C, D, E. Um, you know, liquefaction will occur in a site class E, or a, and it might occur in a D, but if you're on hard rock in A, you're not gonna get liquefaction, but you're gonna get high frequency ground motions, right? So site class matters too. All right, how are we gonna get through all this? Um, these are attenuation relationships. We also call them ground motion prediction equations. That's the proper term, gumpies. Uh, ground motion prediction equations and their empirical data based on past earthquakes. And as we've progressed in the last 10 years, especially, we've gotten a lot more data because we've had more 
systematic data collection from Fukushima, from Maui, from all of the New Zealand earthquakes, we're able to characterize the ground motion prediction equations much, much better, even within the last 10 years. Um, so basically you have a log scale of peak ground acceleration or some measure of earthquake acceleration at your site. And you measure that with the seismograph according to the distance between the seismograph and the earthquake hypocenter, and you group these by different magnitudes. So for every different magnitude, you have a different ground motion prediction equation, and you can generate all these different curves, okay? And that's what a Gumpy is. You don't need to know any more for right now what that is. But basically, we take that, and we're able to de-aggregate the, the different earthquake waves that come into a site into different spectral frequencies. So every earthquake that generates, it generates waves that come to our site, but it has different spectral frequencies. And this is important to the structural analysis because if your fundamental period of your structural feature is equal to the, the strong ground motions that are generated by the earthquake, your um, going to set up a standing wave in your structure and you're going to have greater damage. So the spectral frequencies generated by different earthquakes matters and different earthquakes generate different spectral frequencies. Okay. Note to self, when there are crustal sources that are close to your dam, you have high frequency ground motions, uh, really much greater. But if you have a large earthquake that's at distant sources, like the Cascadia subduction zone interface earthquakes, you have strong ground motions that have low spectral frequencies, right? Because they can transmit through the ground further. And that if your dam is affected more by the low frequency um, uh, earthquake ground motions, then you're going to get hammered, right? So that's why that matters. All right, so we're going to go into the DSHA real quick and explain that um, there's supposed to be a certain thing um, on that last slide, but I'm just going to launch into the DSHA. Basically, all you do is this is the, the old school way to do it, and it forms a basis for probabilistic at this point. You just say, we're going to have an earthquake. I don't care how often, but it's, it, it's like the MCE. I'm sorry, it is the MCE, but it's like the PMF for hydro. It's just, we're going to have the big flood. We're going to have the big earthquake and which one is going to affect our dam. So for the dams along Columbia River, we had this done by a contractor. There, These three dams have different um, MCE maximum credible earthquakes. Um, for John Day, the MCE or the biggest earthquake that we could ever imagine um, is from this particular fault. I think that's the Columbia Hills fault. But for Bonneville, um, the, the, the fault that produces, could produce the largest earthquake just in an infinite time period would be the Mount Hood fault. It's a different magnitude, it has different spectral frequencies, but it's closer. And the measure is that, you know, you gotta, you gotta characterize that as a, as a minimum. So in the, in the same way that we characterize hydrologic hazard using, using the PMF, you want to design for the, the MCE, the maximum credible earthquake, and the ground motions from the MCE. So that would be MCE subscript GM ground motions from either of these. And those go into design. And why do we do that in design? Because they're easier, and that's how we've done it in the past. Sooner or later, we're going to we're going to move beyond deterministic design ground motions. We're going to move to probabilistic design ground motions, but I'll get to that in a sec. The other value of using MCE ground motions is that it provides a check on us for um, checking the probabilistic results. In other words, are these probabilistic results reasonable? Mm, I don't know. So let me summarize those two real quick. In determinist, we just pick a couple of scenarios. We say, the Mount Hood fault is the fault that's going to produce the big earthquake for Bonneville Dam, and it's usually a worst case earthquake scenario. And then we choose the largest expected ground motions from that selected scenario. Okay. In probabilistic, and this is where we all should be getting to, is we consider every single scenario of every single fault that could potentially affect that dam produce ground motions. This is important because. Different earthquakes, different seismic sources have different return periods. 
and they also have different magnitudes. So we have to consider all of those in characterizing a hazard. So it gets far more complex than flood, flood probabilistic because earthquakes can come from any different direction. Floods always come from upstream, got news for you, right? So it computes the rate of every single scenario. And then the, all of those rates from all those different scenarios get concatenated into one big probability of exceedance of the ground shake. Okay, so I think it's not going to show here, but there is an equation. Oh, it is showing. That's the equation for you engineers, triple integral, just um, including all of these different possible earthquakes. And these symbols represent M for magnitude, R for radial distance to the source, and epsilon for the uncertainty in that attenuation relationship. So all of those things come into capturing quantitatively the uncertainty of ground motions for all of those potential seismic sources, okay? So you don't need to memorize that. Um, you just need to know that the PSHA is an explicit treatment of uncertainty that, cap that is captured by looking at the uncertainty in the magnitude, the source to site distance, and the, um, and the epsilon value in the ground motion attenuation relationships. It comes together like this. You should have this PDF. Um, you might want to look at this in more detail. I'm not going to cover it that much, but basically the input parameters are the seismic source model on the left, which includes seismic sources here or aerial sources. If you're in a different area where we don't understand the faults well enough, you have to go to that aerial sources. That comes into the seismic source characterization. You then have the ground motion models, which are generated from the ground motion prediction equations from empirical earthquakes. You then construct the basic hazard curve here. Um, in this case, it's a log log, so it shows a little different. And then you um, look at the different spectral frequencies of that hazard curve. You look at the 0.1 second, the 1 second, the 0.2 second spectral frequencies. And then for each of those different period of vibrations or spectral frequencies, you come up with a spectral acceleration. And you end up with this curve, and that's where we're headed, is a response spectra. Right, so that's what you use in the analysis of your structures is the response spectra. So the reason for this whole complex slide is to show you guys that you don't just take a response spectra. There's a there's a way to calculate that for each one, and there's uncertainty associated with each of these. So there is actually an uncertainty in a response spectra. We don't usually show it because it gets too complex, but you have to acknowledge that uncertainty. So how do we use that? Oh my goodness, um, I'm getting close on time. Let me give you some examples. We can get a seismic site site specific seismic hazard curve. Sorry, there's hey, feedback. Yeah, Keith, you still have about 15 minutes. Okay. Then I'll slow down. No, I won't. We got about 12 minutes left, I think, of content. So the seismic sort of thank it. Thanks, Adam. That that helps a lot. Um, seismic hazard curve, we do that for every site if you need to do it, right? You don't always have to do a site specific seismic hazard curve, but where it's going to impact either design or risk assessment, thou shall do that per engineering regulation 1806. You have to do it if you're going to design something and there's going to be any consideration of seismic design. You have to do a seismic site specific seismic hazard characterization just to be clear, because there are folks in the core who are trying to not do that. Um, how do you, well, here's the seismic hazard curve. And what you can do is given that annual frequency of exceedance or AEP annual exceedance probability on a lot of time I log. Uh, Sorry, it's a semi-log, but it's not really a log on this Y scale. You can plot the seismic hazard curve. So in other words, that you're telling the likelihood of any given peak ground acceleration. You can also generate a seismic hazard curve for different spectral frequencies. 
you would choose as a structural engineer, you would choose the spectral frequency of concern for your fundamental period of the feature that you're interested, in, whether it's a trunnion gate or a spillway wall or the earthen embankment, these all have different spectral frequencies. So you could generate a seismic hazard curve for those different spectral accelerations. And then you can go to a site specific curve like this and figure out what the likelihood of a certain ground motion probability of exceedance. And that's what goes into your risk assessment, right? All right. So one way we could do this pretty easily is USGS is taken on the lead of doing this nationally. So we've generated the seismic hazard map on a national basis so that you can go to the USGS website. You can figure out a seismic hazard curve for any place in the country and other places like Guam and, and um, Commonwealth. But this is really good as a screening tool. It is not to be used for design, right? Because it's a regional analysis and I sit on this steering committee for the seismic hazard map, um, so I can tell you that you should not use this for site specific, but you can use it for screening. You can use it for the quote SQRA or IES one levels, but when you get to a, a detailed IES or even a dam safety mod, you and if seismic hazard is important, you need to do a site specific PSHA. Okay. Enough of that, getting off the soapbox. How do you use this hazard curve from the USGS? There are some toolboxes that Tim O'Leary and Scott Shoebridge have developed that you can pull the data off the USGS website. I'm not gonna do that here, but you can generate this seismic hazard curve. It's not that hard. Um, and you can get, say, the PGA for, say, your one in 10,000 event, or 10 to the minus four. You can also do that for the 10 to the minus five. Um, can you do it for 10 to minus six? Well, if you're a nuclear power industry exec, you're going to want to do it for 10 to minus six because that's our rig. But the USGS, I'm sorry, the US Army Corps only takes us to 10 to minus fifth, but there might be some risk assessments that you want to go deeper. You're going to need to do a site specific. You can't use the USGS screen tool to go that deep in the probabilities. Basically, you just come up with the PGA. Um, for a given AEPs, right? And just some important notes, only for regional hazard screening and periodic assessment. You can then also, the USGS website also allows you to generate the response spectra for different uniform hazard levels. In other words, different probabilities of exceedance. You might expect that as you go to from more common response spectra to rare response spectra from lower to upper here. You're getting further and further um, into lower probabilities or larger return periods. Um, you get higher and higher spectral accelerations for the different periods. So as a, as a structural engineer, you're gonna go to your period of um, concern for your feature, whether it's one second or a half second or 0.25 second, you're going to go to your hazard curve, your hazard response spectra, and you're going to pull off a value for design at a certain probability. So if you're concerned in 1% in 50 year or roughly the, the 1 in 5,000 event, you're going to go to this curve. And if your spectral frequency of concern is a half a second, then you're going to get a ground motion um, that's shown right there about 0.8 or 0.9. Okay, so that's how you use this uniform hazard response spectra. The problem is that this is a concatenation of all of the probabilistic sources, right? And um, that's good for screening, but for specific structures, it might not always be representative of the sources that contribute the most to spectral frequencies at your given site. In other words, if you have an embankment dam near Portland, you're going to be concerned more on the right side of this response spectra. But if you're concerned about um, trunnion gates that are on one of these dams that sits very close, like Bonneville, very close to a crustal source, you're going to be more concerned with the higher, um, the, the shorter spectral frequencies, the higher um the lower uh, period, sorry, you're going to be on the left side of the curve. So how do we handle that? And well, this is the example is intercept megathrust. 
um, earthquakes dominate the long period ground motions for distant dams. You're far on the right side of the response spectra. But the shallow crustal earthquakes dominate the short period motion. So you have to understand whether you're on short period or long period ground motions in your uh, design um, characteristics. So how do you do that? Well, you can de-aggregate the plots. And there's a, there's a, a way to do this on the USGS uh, thing. It's the old data set. I think it's 2018. It might even be 2014. Just so you know, in 2023, we are going to produce DAG plots. The USGS is going to do that. That's what the steering committee is advising them because these are really valuable. And how do you read one of these? Um, what you what you have here is it's important for you to understand what these are. So I'm going to take a minute to go through this. The DAG plots um, or deaggregation plots are important to understand where your ground motions are coming from. And I use downtown Portland. This is actually the NPW uh, district office location just for fun. The source to site distance is along one axis. The magnitude of the earthquake is on the other axis. And then the vertical axis is the contribution to hazard. So you might be thinking right now, what you should be asking is, for the Portland district office or NWP, what's the most likely contributor to hazard? What you do is you say, you go to the tallest skyscraper, or we call this the tombstone diagram. You can, you can go to this higher skyscraper and say, all right, the largest contributor to hazard is the Cascadia interface zone, the mega thrust. And it's located, you know, about 100 or 120 kilometers from the thing, but it's gonna be, if you get a big earthquake, a eight and a half for the M9 scenario, that's the most likely contributor to hazard at that particular spot. And that's because of this mega thrust. So you only care about that if you have long period ground motions, because the short period ground motions are going to attenuate and not reach the site. If you do care about the short period frequencies, in other words, you have gates and little things that rattle a lot, then you're going to be more concerned with the ones from the crustal faults. And they're your major contributor are these ones. And these are the sort these are the faults that are like 10 or 15 kilometers. And all you need is a magnitude six and you're gonna drive the hazard. So you can pick which one that you are interested in analyzing based on your structural characteristics. How do we, why would that be important? Well, uh, that'll have to come into the next slide. I'll just throw that out there as a teaser. The site-specific PSAJ aggregates all of the different hazards from all of the different contributors. This is another way to figure out what your primary source is for your particular um, structural frequency. You can deaggregate the hazard contributions on the hazard curve. So the hazard curve is this, the total mean hazard is shown in the big fat black line on the far right. And then the different contributors to the hazard depend on the different annual exceedance probabilities or the return, return period for these different uh, sources. This is actually success dam in um, central California, the hazard curve for that. You can see that at the peak ground accelerations, the primary contribute to hazard out here on the right side of the curve is this source called the Sierra Foothills background seismicity, because we don't actually know what fault it is. It's an aerial source. And that drives the hazard at peak ground motions and at deep return periods. So we're actually looking for a dam in California. We're using East Coast techniques to characterize the primary driver for the hazard. Total hazard curve, dominant contributor at PGA, at high PGAs is this aerial source zone, but the uh, significant contrib contributors at the low PGAs, but they're more common if are these faults that are shown in solid lines like the San Andreas or the Coast Ranges Sierra and Boundary Block. It's another fault basically. So we need to know that, right? Because they contribute different spectral frequencies. How do we care how do we wrap this into how you guys are going to analyze and analyze it? is you take that information and we need to know what the time history at a given site is for, um, to, in order to characterize the response of the performance. Some feedback, are you telling me something there, Adam? Uh, this is Darcy, I'm just giving you your five minute check. We got that. <laughs> 
ground motion histories, um, how do we use that? Is we need to know at your site, how is the energy going to get input to your site? And this is how you use it in FLAC or LS Diner or any of these more complex um, seismic analytical tools. We don't just use the peak ground acceleration. You actually know how, how to, you need to know how that energy is going to come through your site, how long a duration it is. It's kind of like flood frequency. If you have an instantaneous peak and then 15 minutes later, there's no water, you can design differently than if you're on the Mississippi and that flood peak comes in and sits high for months. Same sort of thing with the, the ground motions. You, you want to know what's the shape of your expected time history curve. So what we do basically is we take empirical measurements of time histories and then we match our expected magnitude and our expected spectral frequency to those empirical time histories. There is definitely an art to this because we just don't have enough time histories and we don't have enough time or enough money to use hundreds of time histories, which is really what you need to do. So there, the art comes in picking out the appropriately scaled time history from the empirical database that is applicable and representative to your particular site. So the first question, if you ever want to review one of these things, the first question you ask people is, how did you pick your time history? And you'll get some interesting. So that's, that's the content. And I want to just summarize here with, I think this slide, maybe there's another slide. Um, I just want to wrap this up to remind you how we use this, right? Everything that I just talked about is here on the left side. This is a seismic hazard. That's where the loading is in your event tree, not the logic tree. This is an event tree. Your, your goal as a seismic source characterization analyst is to generate the seismic hazard curve in the form of this curve or any kind of um, response spectrum. And then you pass that over to the seismic expert on your cadre who's going to be doing, or the seismic risk cadre, which is now stood up. Um, and those folks will be taking the seismic hazard curve and generate the seismic performance. So if this is of concern to the dam that you're doing a risk assessment on, you're going to work with folks like Ethan Dawson and you're going to work with folks like Dave Serafini and Josh Corbett and Gabriella, those are, and Carmen Williams. These are the folks who are running the seismic risk cadre, right? Um, so that's where we are. And then you go from there. You figure out, all right, what's the probability of a certain crack forming after that seismic performance? And then you go on through the rest of the, um, you know, the, the standard of entries that you guys are talking about for the rest of the week. All right, so that's what we got, and I'll just get in there and open it up for questions or hand it back to Darcy or Adam or whoever wants to take on. All right, thanks, thanks Keith. Keith. What questions do we have for Keith about seismic hazards? Okay, Keith, we have one. Okay, you got to do it verbal because I'm not able to see the chats right now. I have a yeah, we got it verbal. Very simple question. Is there a, another um, RMC course that goes into more detail about how to conduct these? Uh, RMC, no. Um, we should do that, but I think that um, the course that you want to take note is called Prospect 247. Um, and we give it once a year. It's usually, in per well, it will be in person this year. The last couple of years has been virtual. Um, I think that it's going to be in person in the uh, Davis Tech uh, Davis thing. It's usually, um, I can't remember. The person to contact um, is Khaled Chowdhury. He's in the SPP Dam Safety Production Center. Um, Scott Schubert started it, um, then passed it over to me. I ran it for a couple, three years, and I passed it over to Khaled. About two years ago, so like two four seven is the one we want to take note in more detail. So that's for seismic embankment performance. I think prospect courses are only offered to internal core people. Sorry, 
Um, do so we have non core people on this? We do. We do. We're, we have about half halvesies, half internal and half folks from other agencies. So I, I and think our, our response would be no, but there's obviously a need. Uh, but mm. sorry, no additional well, information about that at this time. There yeah. are other. Yeah, there's other mechanisms. I mean, basically, if you want to get to that point in your external, you can either work with the core or you would hire other folks. I'm, there's a whole commercial industry about doing that. And if you want to learn and you're outside the core, you probably would want to contract with somebody else. But, you know, work, work with us. It's all good. Um, Thanks, I should Keith. also say, I just one last comment on that is it depends on your portfolio out of our 700 dams. I've kind of done a screening for, I have done a screening through RMC funding of all of our primary dams in the key seismic areas, Pacific Northwest, Madrid and New England. There are some others, but what we found through that screening is that the portfolio that the core has in the central and eastern U.S., it's really unlikely that we're going to end up going to a detailed seismic hazard analysis for any of the dams except those in the Pacific Northwest. And so if you're an owner of Bureau and most of your dams are in the western U.S., you're going to need to do that, and you already know that. But if you're TVA, you're going to have to do that, and if you're with TVA, you already know you guys have a an awesome program already. The other folks, I'm not sure where you're from, but you may or may not need to go into the uh, seismic and analytical details that were that would follow from this hazard. So send me a note if you want, we can talk about it. We got one more question for you, Keith, from Carolyn. Hi, Keith. Hi. It's been so long since we've talked. Um, <laughs> So this is probably in the weeds, but I was just curious. So you showed a picture of deterministic versus probabilistic um, decision of how which faults were going to uh, impact a structure. And I assume in the probabilistic approach, you would look at each fault as an individual um, uh, possibility. And I had heard at one point that there was that when you have one fault activated, it can also then trigger other faults to activate as well at the same time. And so I was curious if you looked at each fault individually, or if you also included the combination when you have one fault that uh, triggers action on another fault that's nearby. Yeah, that's a really good question. And there are some really smart people in that in the USGS. Um, the triggering issue has led to, um, you know, we kind of recognized that with the Landers earthquake in 1992 is that we had a moderate magnitude earthquake and it ended up growing and growing as it progressively triggered other other faults that were previously deem, deemed inactive. So since 92, the community has been aware of that. And here's how we've handled it in California, which is the primary driver, is that we have, um, the USGS, not the USGS, is characterizing these mega. Um, what's the right word for? It? Anyway, it's the it's the linked sources. So there's a probability of a earthquake generating on a certain segment, and then a probability of it progressing to the next segment, and the next segment, and the next segment. And there's a inversion that is done with uses all of the paleo seismic information from all these different faults and it comes up with a probability of the segment single segment rupture the dual double segment rupture and then the multi segment ruptures and so it's a it's an expansion of the probabilistic theory but we've already done it in the U, in the California and it's now been incorporated in the 2018 version of the seismic hazard map for the areas that that's been done. So, short answer, Carolyn, is yes, we do characterize the, the triggered rupture. And if you want more information on that, go to um, either the USGS website or the California website. It's called UCERF3. We call that USERF, and it's called Unified. <laughs> 
California earthquake rupture forecast model, USER 3, it's the third one. So um, if you need that again, it's usurf.org or something like that, but just web that, just Google that and you'll come up with it. If you need more info, just email me and I can set you straight. It's a good question, Carolyn. All right, Keith, quickly, we have one more question and then we need to move on. Well, quickly, four. Okay. <laughs> Bring them on. Question on your uh, on your gumpies. Do they vary geographically? Because you get um, a lot more attenuation western U.S. than you do eastern U.S. Absolutely. So you have to select your ground motion prediction equation based on where you are, and the, this is this has been this is now a, you we used to be concerned about that. And now the GMPEs are generated for the Western US and they're generated for the center, central and they're generated from the Eastern. The trick is what if your dam is say, Dillon Dam in Denver, right? Or what if your dam is at, um, in the Eastern Sierras? So you got the Western US gumpies, but you're also gonna get earthquakes from a central uh, earthquake source that that follows the motion prediction equations from a different part of the country. That's where it gets tricky. We've got a way to figure that out. It's, it's a good point. There are definitely different ground motion prediction equations that are developed for different path geologies is what it ends up being. Right. Over. All right, thanks, Keith. We appreciate it.